This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. This chapter is going to go through and look at financial instruments. So it's one of the most complex topics within the whole of the P2 syllabus because it covers such a large area of complex accounting. So let's go through and have a look at what standards are covered which will help you see why it is such a complex area. Because first of all, we've got that IS32, uh, Financial Instruments, which is all about presentation. So that is all about determining whether or not we have essentially, uh, if we have raised finance, are we going to classify it as equity or debt? Uh, as well as thinking about the presentation with regards to equity or debt, we could also think about it from a financial asset perspective and think about whether or not we're going to have it at fair value through profit or loss or fair value through other comprehensive income. But the big issue with regards to presentation is that if you've raised finance, so whether you've issued debt or equity finance, are we going to go through there and classify it as a financial liability or as equity? Because there are complex financial instruments out there. You know, We've seen at F7 level, haven't we? The world of convertible debentures whereby we use split accounting so even though legally it was debt, in substance, it had elements of debt and equity. So we presented it as both debt and equity following the substance over the legal form. And that's just one of the complexities. Uh, as well as IS32, you've also got some new accounting standards, IFRS 7. So following the financial crisis of 2008 and even before then, uh, when there were issues, we, we decided to go through there and give the user of the accounts more information and disclosure with regards to these risky, complex financial instruments. So not just with regards to the liabilities that we owe, but also the assets that we own and whether or not they are valued correctly and what level of risk are we exposed to with that value of assets that we have within our financial statements. So thinking back to the financial crisis, a lot of the banks had these huge mortgage receivables and those mortgage receivables were subject to considerable levels of risk because people had borrowed beyond their means and were very unlikely to go through and, and pay that borrowing back. And, and there was no disclosure with regards to the level of risk within the financial statement. So we've adopted a new accounting standard, IFRS 7, that goes through there and gives you additional disclosure about the risk that we are faced with with regards to financial assets and financial liabilities. And then we've got IFRS 9. So as you can see, it's a little bit of a, a, a mess, isn't it? It's a bit everywhere. We've still got IS 32, uh, which, which you know, is going to stay there for the time being. But maybe at some point in the future, that will be integrated into a new IFRS and maybe moved into IFRS 9. Because it just seems a bit strange, doesn't it, to have all of these separate standards covering one area of accounting. But as we said, it's complex. And one of the complexities is because we have so many accounting standards. Uh, but at least they've been updated to try and simplify them. And that's what IFRS 9 does. And IFRS 9 goes through there and starts looking at, you know, not presentation or disclosure because they're covered in other standards, but recognition and, and measurement of financial assets and financial liabilities. Looks at de-recognition of financial assets and financial liabilities. Begins to look at more complex aspects as well with regards to impairment of financial assets and the world of hedging. So there's quite a lot that goes on there within IFRS 9. But for the time being, within this session, the introduction, we're just going to focus on what a financial instrument actually is and then begin to look at the presentation. So if we think about what you have with regards to your definitions of what a financial asset or financial instrument is, a financial instrument must give rise to a financial asset in one set of books and a financial liability or equity within an other company's set of books. And that's the key thing to understand is that you don't have the financial asset and liability and equity in one company's set of books. You have the asset in one book and the liability or equity in the other set of books. And it's up to you to determine which company we are doing the accounting for. Is it company A or is it company B? Uh, and the key bit there is that there needs to be some form of contract, whether that's written, verbal, implied between the two. Uh, and what that contract goes through and does is give rise to financial asset, as we said, in company A and the liability or equity in company B, which is where you have the presentation issues from company B's perspective. Is it a liability or is it equity? And what people do is, is that they do tend to panic, maybe rightly so, given the complexity of the standard. But 
some simple day-to-day -day transactions give rise to financial assets and financial liability. Because in Company A's books, if Company A makes a credit sale to Company B, uh, Company A has a receivable. Okay, And that receivable is a contractual right to receive cash, which meets the definition of a financial asset. So Company A has a receivable. Uh, it's sold the goods to Company B on credit. So Company B has bought the goods, hasn't they? So if they bought the goods on credit, they have a payable. That payable is a liability, uh, a financial liability, to give it its true name, because there is a contractual obligation to pay cash, isn't there? So just a simple everyday credit sale, credit purchase, give rise to a financial instrument. So receivables and payables are governed by the standards covering financial instruments. Bet you'd never thought about that before. And what that then leads to is your receivable is a financial asset and that financial asset could be impaired. So forget about your irrecoverable debts and allowance for doubtful receivables. Uh, we need to impair that financial asset and the, the rules for the impairment of a financial asset, the impairment of a receivable is covered within IFRS 9. And we'll touch upon that later. What we also need to consider is maybe company A or company B uh, is looking to raise finance. So we'll say company B is raising the finance and they've decided to go with equity finance. So they have given uh, an investor a residual interest in the net assets of company B. That's what the definition of equity is, isn't it? The assets less the liabilities, a residual interest in those net assets. There's no mention at all, is there, in terms of ownership? Now, essentially, that's what equity is, isn't it? It's ownership within a business. So maybe there's an issue surrounding the definition of what we have as equity. The way we tend to look at it is we look at the financial liability, if it meets the definition of a financial liability, it is a financial liability. And if not, it tends to therefore be equity. But maybe that's not the best way to look at things. But that's something for later on. And if company B has issued the shares, then company A will have gone through there and acquired the shares. Now, company A has an investment in company B shares. It has an investment in the equity or an investment in the shares of another entity so therefore that by definition is a financial asset if we think back to company b company b is the one that needs to raise the finance so we could raise finance via shares or alternatively it could go with debt finance the issue of debt gives rise to a financial liability the reason why it is a financial liability is it is an obligation to pay cash a contractual obligation to pay cash so therefore meets the definition of a financial liability. And then what you have there is in Company A's books, assuming Company A has bought that debt, it has an investment in Company B's debt. So it has a contractual interest in that debt and therefore a contractual right to receive the cash. So therefore, by definition, that is a financial asset. Now, what we need to go through and do is we need to look at the assets and the liabilities or equities or financial assets and financial liabilities. And we need to go through there and look at the presentation with regards to IS32. Uh, the recognition and measurement is covered by IFRS 9. The disclosure is covered by IFRS 7. And then within the we've got all various bits and pieces to do with the impairment in IFRS 9. And then if we get into some really complex aspects such as derivatives, uh, can those derivatives then be used then as part of hedging? Oh, sounds, sounds too scary. We'll just keep it simple for the time being. Because what we're going to go through and do is the investment in company B shares. You credit the bank, debit your financial asset. So remember at F7, we went through there, didn't we? And looked at things classified as fair value through profit or loss or fair value through other comprehensive income. Uh, we've also got to go through there and consider your investment in company B's debt. So is that there measured at your amortised cost where we looked at the cash receipts and we looked at the coupon rate of interest and how we then accounted for that and incorporated substance by looking at the effective rate of interest to go through there and work out your interest income. And then we look at the flip side of that, don't we, with regards to your financial liability and your issue of debt. And again, we measure that at amortised cost. So everything essentially is just reversed, isn't it? Okay. So that's where we'll we'll kick things off once we've looked at the, the next example. Uh, but I want you to go through there. And the key bit, if we think about presentation for now, is thinking about is it a financial liability or is it equity? And it's a financial liability if there is a contractual obligation to deliver cash per the standard. And it is equity, essentially, if there is no contractual obligation, it therefore gives 
a residual interest in the net asset of the entity, i.e. the assets less the liability. Whatever's left is what you own, isn't it? But there's no mention of ownership within the standard. So let's go through there and have a look at the example that you have within your notes. Uh, the requirement says there, discuss whether the B shares should be treated as liabilities or equity in the financial statement. So all about presentation. Is it an asset? Sorry, apologies. Is it a financial liability or is it equity? It's a financial liability if there is an obligation to pay cash. Uh, it is equity if there is no obligation and it just gives a residual interest in the net assets, doesn't it? So it says there, Lisa has an issue, two different classes of shares being A shares and B shares. Uh, the A shares are equity shares with voting rights attached and have been correctly classified as equities. There is no obligation to pay cash. So remember, we're looking currently at the B shares, but the A shares that are in existence are equity shares. Okay, uh, There is no obligation to pay cash. The key bit, it says the B shares are redeemable in three years time. So if they're redeemable, they're usually going to be redeemable, aren't they, in terms of cash. Uh, and those shares have a nominal value, is it there, of one dollar each. It says, however, there is a choice of methods with regards to the redemption. It says we can either redeem the shares for cash at the nominal value. So that's the uh, taking the one dollar. Or could you instead take an A share as settlement? OK. Now, we're going to go through there and look, and look at the economic substance, the economic reality. What would happen? What would be the most beneficial, if you like, from the investor's perspective? Because from the investor's perspective, you would take the cash if the share fell below that nominal value of a pound. So if the share was 80 cents, you would take the cash uh, because you're going to get one dollar back, aren't we, as opposed to the 80 cents. But if the share was more valuable than the nominal value, which hopefully that would be the case, then you will not go through there uh, and take the cash. You would take the shares, in which case that's looking a little bit more like equity, isn't it? And a residual interest in the net assets. So the key here is what is the value of the shares? Well, it says A shares are currently valued at five dollars per share. So they're currently higher. But, you know, they're not going to be redeemed until three years time. Well, one dollar is the nominal value, isn't it? But the lower share price is there as two dollars per share. So you would have thought it is very unlikely, given what's happened in the past, looking into the future, things shouldn't fall below two dollars. And at the moment, it's at five dollars. So it's got a considerable value to fall by before it even gets to its lowest value. Never mind then falling yet further to below its nominal value. So here, the economic reality would be that the investor would prefer to take the A shares, wouldn't it? So if you're taking the A shares in return for those B shares, then you are essentially issuing equity shares in the future. So therefore, we should account for that redeemable B share as equity because it is going to give rise to the issue of equity in the future. Even though there is an option to redeem for cash, the investor wouldn't take that cash redemption value unless the value of the share fell very considerably. Okay, So just because you see that word redeemable, don't all of a sudden start to think there that we're going to go through there and redeem it for cash and therefore a financial liability. You need to think about the substance and the economic reality and what the investor would go through there and potentially take. Uh, that, if memory serves me right, is an extract uh, from an old past exam question. So you may come across it again as you work through past exam questions, uh, or you may come across it in an ever so slightly disguised fashion. Okay, uh, But that covers the presentation in terms of equity and debt. We're going to go through and move on within the next video and begin to look at your financial assets. So from me, that's goodbye from now.